What was that, Houston? Oh, we have liftoff? Hell yeah. Strap in, everybody. We got another Rob Job review here. Today, we are diving into heart failure pharmacology. So without further ado, let's dive in. The big thing here before we go in, just a quick disclaimer is I am not a pharmacist. In fact, I'm the last thing from a pharmacist. I'm just a student trying to pass the next test and this helped me. And I'm hoping that it helps you. So in terms of understanding, so like before we dive into the drugs, we should understand the two types of heart failure that we're talking about. The two types of heart failure are systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. So for the first one, systolic heart failure, we're, de we're dealing with dilated cardiomyopathy with a reduced ejection fraction. So essentially the left ventricle is widened, it's dilated, and with that it has an increased end diastolic volume, an increased end systolic volume, and then decreased contractility. That vent it's, a, it's a systolic contraction problem, so it actually has um, it's a failure for that left ventricle to contract. And here in the red, we can see that we have reduced contractility. And then here we can see that that end uh, diastolic volume has increased. Now, a nice mnemonic for this is Mr. Ass. So the two types of presentations that we see within systolic heart failure is mitral regurge. And then the murmur for mitral regurge is holosystolic murmur. And then we also see aortic stenosis, which is the diamond shaped, shaped murmur. Again, the mnemonic Mr. Ass stands for mitral regurge, aortic stenosis, and that's underneath systolic heart failure. Now moving over here with diastolic heart failure, we see this within hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So essentially the left ventricle increases in size. With that increased size, we have a decrease in end diastolic volume because there's not as much space for that blood to occupy. And then with that, we see a compensatory increase in filling pressure because that ventricle has a tough time ejecting that blood. It's like the stiffening of that left ventricle. So here in the green, we see that that pressure increases. Then we also see that decrease end diastolic volume that I was talking about. With diastolic heart failure, the mnemonic is DARMS. DARM stands for aortic regurge and mitral stenosis is related to diastolic heart failure. And then the two things that we should know with aortic regurge is that it's um, associated with that decrescendo murmur and a wide pulse pressure and mitral stenosis is related to a dec decrescendo murmur. And that's another thing that this mnemonic can help us out with is DARMS. The D can kind of tune us in not only to diastolic, but that both of these um, both of these diseases within diastolic heart failure also have a decrescendo murmur. Sweet. So to frame our conversation for the drugs below, it's super important that we know three variables, contractility, preload, and afterload. These are important because these are the three variables that we're gonna try and modulate to treat both systolic and diastolic heart failure. So contractility here is this line here on the pressure volume curve, and this is the strength of the cardiomyocyte, the amount of force exerted during contraction. The second thing is preload. Preload is usually talked about in regard to volume, and it's like the wall stretch at the end of diastole, or the volume that that left ventricle occupies, um, at it's max filling. And the last variable is afterload, which is ventricular wall tension during systole, and that's the resistance that that left ventricle has to overcome to eject blood out of that aortic valve. And here we see preload in the corner, afterload is this arch of the pressure volume curve, and then contractility is that diagonal there in the top left corner. So just remember, as we're talking about these drugs below, we, we're using these drugs to modulate these three things to hopefully treat um, these two types of heart failure. So without further ado, let's hit the drugs, the pharmacology. Again, as I said before, these are the mnemonics that I use for me. Um, I hope they mean something to you, but if not, there's no hurt feelings over here. Um, I know some of them are a stretch, but the first hitter is furosemide. So furosemide is a powerful diuretic and the mnemonic that we're hitting here is the furious sweater. We're just getting rid of the water, the salt, the potassium, um, the furious sweater furosemide. The mechanism of action is it inhibits sodium, potassium, and chlorine transporters. So none of that is getting into the cell. So we actually have rapid sodium and water excretion. This is this is an amazing drug used for um, systolic congestive heart failure, and it really helps patients get out of congestion. 
And this is a drug because we're shedding all of that stuff, we're decreasing preload. So we're decreasing the amount of volume that's actually occupying that left ventricle. Moving on, we have a family of drugs called the RAS drugs. Um, I think that stands for renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So these drugs are targeting that RAS pathway. And that RAS pathway starts with um, angiotensin 1, then that gets converted to angiotensin 2, and then that then uh, activates aldosterone. So the first one in that lineup is lisinopril. The mnemonic for lisinopril is ACE your license test. Whew, I know that's like a cheesy freshman in high school mnemonic, but ACE your license test. We all want our driver's license. Um, the big thing there is lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor. And um, all of these drugs are gonna lead to vasodilatation. And because this leads to vasodilatation, there's less pressure for that left ventricle to overcome. So we decrease afterload. And then the second drug in the RAS is Losartan. Losartan is the angiotensin II receptor blocker. And the only thing that I could think of here is like low start. So low start, number two, because you, if you were the high start, you'd be number one. So low start number two, low sartan attacks the angiotensin II receptor blocker. Then last but not least is spironolactone. This is the one that targets aldosterone. And here I'm just kind of looking at the last syllable for the mnemonic, spironolactone, aldosterone, spironolactone, aldosterone. And that's the mnemonic that I have for that. Um, one thing that I did not cover in this is with lisinopril, just remember that this one actually, since it um, targets the beginning part of the pathway, it increases bradykinin, so that is related to the bradykinin cough. On to the beta blockers. These were covered in the last video that I hit, but just to remind you guys of the beta blockers, the mnemonic is garlic aioli on a nice tuna sandwich. The reason why we do that is in alphabetical order, we go alol, ilol, olol, olol. And in alphabetical order, we then decrease specificity. So meaning that with labetalol and carvedilol, we have alpha-1 and beta antagonist. So that's the most specific. Metropolol, the second, is just a beta-1. And then propranolol is the most um, wide-ranging, and it's just a beta antagonist. All three of these drugs, the beta blockers, are going to be, be used to decrease heart rate, heart rate and contractility. The main thing, yeah, the main things that these do are they just do that and they just like help the, um, yeah, they help that because they're all antagonists. So they're all going to kind of like bring that curve down and yeah, decrease heart rate in both uh, contractility. Moving on to the vasodilators. The first vasodilator that we have in the lineup is hy hydralazine. Hydralazine, it, the mnemonic that I thought of is just like high and relaxed, you know? You just had a good evening, you're high and relaxed, you're vasodilated, you have that smooth muscle potassium activator hydralazine. So what this is going to do is since it is a vasodilator, it is going to decrease afterload. And all of these vasodilators, like I've said before, are going to decrease afterload because we have less resistance in our systemic vasculature, which is going to make it easier to eject out of that left ventricle. The second vasodilator is isosorbidinitrate. Just a long word to get to nitric oxide, which is that potent, potent vasodilator, isonitro, isosorbidinitrate. And then the third one is secubitril. Secubitril. Oh my gosh, I don't even remember this. Suck on your drop license test. Oh, we're just doing all the license stuff together. So yeah, you don't want to suck on your license test. This one's important, actually. So secubitril, the reason why I chose license again is because it's a neprolysin inhibitor. So neprolysin is the enzyme that metabolizes these natrolytic peptides that are released um, in your atria during high wall tension. And those uh, peptides, I think, are, I won't be able to, it's like ANC, BNC, and CNC or something like that. What those do is those are potent vasodilators. So we're inhibiting an enzyme that inhibits those naturopathic peptides. The biggest thing to remember here is that we want those naturalytic peptides to be there because they're really potent vasodilators. And the mnemonic for secubitril is don't suck on your driver's license. License meaning neprolysin. Um, 
yeah, that one's a stretch there, but maybe I hope even just talking through that kind of helped you out. Um, and then on to the ion inotropes. I inotropes um, just increase heart rate. That's what inotropes do um, by definition. So the first inotrope we did go over this last time is dobutamine. We're tuning into the B here on dobutamine. This um, is a beta one agonist, meaning that that's going to increase heart rate and increase contractility right there on the heart. The second one is digoxin. Um, for digoxin, we're just like digging that Na into the cell. So what digoxin does is it increases it increases intracellular intracellular sodium, so that obviously will then lead to a higher depolarization. It'll increase heart rate and contractility. And last but not least, we have milrinone, which is a phosphodiesterine inhibitor. The biggest thing that that does is that um, inhibits the degradation of CAMP. We know that CAMP is a huge part of like contractility and muscle contraction. So if we inhibit CAMP, we actually end up um, directly increasing heart rate and contractility. And the only mnemonic that I could think of milrinone is mil, like general mil cereal at summer camp. Gosh, um, I love cereal at summer camp. But anyways, we're eating that cereal at summer camp. We're inhibiting the degradation of camp. We have increased camp, increased heart rate and contractility. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for tuning in. I hope that helps. I hope that made some sort of sense um, in some capacity. The biggest thing here is like all of these drugs um, really know the how these modulate these three variables, contractility, preload, and afterload, because those are going to be huge um, for keeping patients not only alive, but just like stable, whether they're going through systolic or diastolic heart failure. Um, that's all I got for today. Rob job, over and out.